welcome to today's lecture on the mighty Pharaoh Djoser. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to take an in-depth look at the king who started the pyramid craze. That's right, this is the guy who built Egypt's very first pyramid, starting a millennia-long obsession of robbers looting pyramids, Roman aristocrats copying pyramids, and modern tourists flocking to the pyramids. In doing so, we'll investigate not just what the pyramids look like, but also how it was built, why Djoser spent so much time and effort on something he'd use only after he was dead. So whether you're looking to found your own dynasty, or you just want to start a hot new trend, journey with me as we investigate Djoser, the first pyramid builder. Our focus today, the King Djoser, was the first king of the Third Dynasty, and the first king of the Old Kingdom in ancient Egypt. What makes this really weird is that he was actually the true-born son of the last king of the Second Dynasty. But Manetho, among other historians, thought Djoser's contributions were just so, well, monumental, that he deserved to be the first in his own new dynasty. After kicking off the Old Kingdom, Djoser is said to have reigned for 29 long years, during which his political and architectural accomplishments would be impressive, to say the least. Now, kingdoms in Egypt, like the Old Kingdom we have here, were times of strong centralized power, relative wealth, and political expansion into foreign lands. And Djoser was certainly no exception here. He launched several expeditions into the Sinai Peninsula, the desert area east of the Nile River Delta. And there he was looking for precious metals and minerals like turquoise and copper. And amazingly, it's still possible to see the inscriptions from Djoser's 4,500 year old march carved into the rock there today. One of the most famous references to Djoser's reign is an inscription known as the Famine Stila. Now, a stela is basically a large, flat stone inscription. Think of something that looks a bit like a tombstone. And on this particular stela, we get a story of a famine that broke out during Djoser's reign and lasted for seven years. After consulting every advisor in the kingdom, no one had a good answer about how to stop it. Then Djoser dreamt of Khnum, the god of the source of the Nile River who told him that it was the decay and disrepair of his temple at Elephantine that was causing this famine. Upon arriving at Elephantine, he rebuilt the temple, the famine stopped, and Djoser became a hero of the people. So are we looking at fact or fiction here? Well, we really do have a temple at Elephantine, at least partially constructed by Djoser. But we really have no way of knowing whether this was built in response to a famine since the stele itself is from the Ptolemaic period, 2,500 years after Djoser's reign. What this does tell us, however, is that Djoser was loved and respected by later Egyptian populations, who found him just as important as modern Egyptologists do today. In 
It wasn't just all Djoser's brilliance and magnificence that led him to cure the famine by restoring the temple at Elephantine. He had a man named Imhotep as his vizier, and a vizier was the highest ranking official that would serve the king. Now Imhotep was actually the one to suggest that he act on this dream by sailing south to repair the temple at Elephantine. That wouldn't be Imhotep's only contribution though. Throughout Djoser's reign, Imhotep would play a crucial role as vizier, as advisor, and as physician, and perhaps most importantly as an architect for the pharaoh Djoser. Now, Imhotep was born a commoner, and he rose to power through his skill and talents. One of the titles Imhotep gained during this process was the quote-unquote overseer of all stone works. And as a result, most Egyptologists today view him as the planner and architect of Djoser's Step Pyramid at Saqqara. Not a bad thing to put on your resume, designing Egypt's first ever pyramid. But some other scholars argue that he's also the first person to use stone columns in architecture, a trend that would be uh, exemplified thousands of years later in Greek and Roman architecture as well. He was more than just an architect though. Imhotep was also a renowned physician. His major contribution, at least according to later Egyptians, was to start thinking of disease as caused by natural things, rather than by something sent by the gods. Basically, this is the same contribution that Hippocrates made in Greece, but that was more than 2,000 years later. The 16th century BCE Edwin Smith Papyrus, a long document of ailments and cures, is thought by some scholars to be a later copy of a text originally penned by the vizier Imhotep. 2,000 years after Imhotep lived, later Egyptians deified him, making him a god of healing and medicine, and eventually associating him with the god Thoth, God of architecture, scribes, math, and medicine. And so when the Greeks took over Egypt during the Ptolemaic period, they merged Imhotep with Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And in this way, Imhotep, once a commoner, became immortal in a way that not even his uh, pharaoh Djoser was able to achieve. The Step Pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara, near ancient Memphis in modern Cairo, stands today as the first pyramid in all of Egypt, dating back to around 2650 BCE. The pyramid didn't arise out of nothing, however, a mere invention out of the great mind of Imhotep. Rather, it built, quite literally, upon previous Egyptian funerary practices. Up until this point, Egyptian royalty would be buried in what's called a mastaba tomb. And a mastaba was a rectangular tomb with sides that were slightly angled inward. Like the bottom of a pyramid if you chopped it off about 20% of the way up. The mastaba was supposed to represent the primordial mound from which all life and all gods arose when the waters of chaos subsided in the earliest days. Imhotep and Djoser's innovation then was to stack increasingly smaller mastabas one on top of another until we had a massive symbolic primordial mound and the world's first pyramid. With this pyramid, we get six increasingly smaller steps eventually rising to a height of more than 200 feet and with a base of nearly 400 feet on each side. This was by far the tallest and largest man-made structure on Earth at the time. And it was also the first monumental structure built entirely out of stone. Everything else had been mud brick up until Djoser's Step Pyramid. Pyramids are more complex than they initially appear, however. Underneath the massive structure, a series of passageways, galleries, and chambers stretch for miles. Many of these are accessed by a shaft that dives almost a hundred feet below the surface. 
The walls of some of these passageways are covered in blue faience, a sort of kind of glass ceramic hybrid. And imagery shows the king participating in his Hebsed, the festival of kingly power rejuvenation. The burial chamber itself is still somewhat of a mystery. The current chamber is made out of granite. And originally there was a stone weighing three and a half tons blocking the entranceway. But Tomb Raider still managed to get in and loot it. And some archaeologists think that the original burial chamber was entirely different. Made out of alabaster with carved stars pointing northward to guide the king into the afterlife. While Djoser's Step Pyramid is clearly the centerpiece of his funerary architecture, it is really just one of many structures that work together to help the king make a successful transition into the afterlife. In its entirety, Djoser's Pyramid Complex contains a Serdab and Hebsed Court, and we'll talk about what those are in just a minute, as well as the Northern Mortuary Temple, another temple, the South Tomb, the House of the South and the House of the North, and of course, the Step Pyramid itself. So let's go ahead and break down what some of these things actually are. So first of all, the entire thing is surrounded by a massive enclosure wall, similar to the huge quote-unquote fort of Casa Kemwe of the Second Dynasty. This was over 30 feet high and had 14 doors. But interestingly, 13 of the 14 doors were false doors where spirits could pass through, but people could not. There was only one entrance for the living, and that led into a colonnaded entranceway with stone pillars, some of the earliest in the world. This entranceway then led to the South Tomb, which many people think of as a separate house for the Ka, or the, the spirit of the dead king. And it wasn't just a tomb. It was the house for the king's spirit for all of eternity. North of the pyramid, we get two important structures, the mortuary temple and the Serdab. Now the mortuary temple is where the rituals surrounding the death, burial, and worship of the king would have taken place. Offerings to the dead would be left here, and the king could be worshiped in death just as he was in life. The Serdab, on the other hand, is the term we use for the small structure that houses the statue of the Ka of the king. The Ka was essentially the eternal spirit of the king, and rituals, like the opening of the mouth ceremony that allowed the king to eat and breathe, would have been performed on this statue very regularly. Amazingly, we still have the Serdab statue of Djoser himself more than 4,500 years after his death. Now there's a lot that's still unknown about the pyramid complex of Djoser and Saqqara. The House of the South and the House of the North still aren't completely understood. And it's unclear how some of the empty spaces in the courtyards would have actually been utilized. Nevertheless, the image we get is that the king is trying to reconstruct his actual living palace so that he can continue the rituals of royalty in the afterlife. And that seems to be confirmed by what we'll look at next. One of the other major components of Djoser's pyramid complex is the Hebsed Court. This was an area dedicated to a royal ritual performance focused on the rejuvenation of kingly power. And to understand this space, we have to understand the festival itself. Some scholars have argued that in the earliest days of Egypt, even before Narmer and unification, rulers would have ritually been killed if they reached a point of old age or disease where they could no longer govern effectively. Naturally, rulers didn't like this very much. And so a ritual was developed where, after 30 years of rule, and every three or four years after that, the pharaoh could perform a ritual of rejuvenation to display his continued strength to his people. 
The festival grew and evolved over time, but the core of the ritual involved the king running two laps around the royal palace, sometimes in the presence of the Apis bull, the divine bull of Egypt and the embodiment of the god Ptah. Now, if the king made it around the race course, he would be declared healthy and rejuvenated and ready to rule for three or four more years. If, of course, he didn't make it, he would be declared infirm and weak, and he would be killed so that a more powerful king could take his place. The Hebsted court and the other courts in Djoser's pyramid complex still show markers where the king would have had to run between in order to prove his strength. Along the sides of the court are a series of chapels, although interestingly, many of these are false buildings, totally walled up with no actual entrance. The thinking here is that the spirits of the afterlife would be able to utilize the buildings even if living humans could not. Now during his life, King Djoser would have run his Hebsed race at his palace in Memphis, although he died a year short of his 30th year of rule. But the Hebsed structures in his funerary complex, along with the South Tomb and the Serdab and the Mortuary Temple, these all suggest that the complex as a whole was meant to mimic the living palace. So that even though the king didn't rule for 30 years in this world, he would be able to complete these rituals, these royal rituals, for all of eternity in the afterlife. While Djoser was actually the son of the second dynasty king, Kasek Henry, he certainly seems to have earned the right to be the founder of his own dynasty, and even of the entire Old Kingdom. He was remembered millennia afterwards as a great and benevolent ruler, and fame even spread to his architect, his physician, and his vizier, Imhotep. Djoser's step pyramid, and indeed the entire pyramid complex at Saqqara, demonstrate the political and economic power of Old Kingdom kings and their religious belief that they need the trappings of life on earth to successfully live and rule in the afterlife as well. With Djoser's step pyramid, we get a cyclical relationship where the construction of the pyramid both showcases the power of the king and adds more power to his rule through the messages it conveys. Just a few lessons you can learn from Joseph.